Hello everyone, Ken here, back with another video for you. I've got a little confession to make. So I always tell you guys to use Kaggle to engage in the community, to do projects there, and admittedly, I haven't really been that active on the platform. So I decided that it was time for me to be accountable, to actually practice what I preach, and I recently started a new Kaggle profile specifically for this channel on the platform. So that's gonna be linked below in the description. I'll also link to the actual analysis that I'm gonna do in this video in the description below. So make sure to click on that workbook so you can actually follow along. So in the video today, I'm gonna to actually go through the Titanic data set and do some analysis and actually submit my results to uh, the actual competition. So you'll be able to see what the process is like of going through and trying to understand this problem, some of the techniques and algorithms that I use, and then actually how to submit your work. I want to make sure that you guys know this video is more focused on how to think about a data science problem, how to think about one of these projects than actually the implementation. So, you know, a lot of people are like, where do I start? How do I know when I'm done? These things I'll cover in this video. The last thing I want to say is it's totally fine to follow along as I'm going through this, but you definitely want to make sure that you're citing your sources whenever you publish something. On Kaggle, you can also fork the notebook and experiment with it. If you don't do that, you should go to the top of the notebook and use Markdown and actually say where uh, you're getting the analysis or the cells from. I tried to do this one without really looking at any additional notebooks. It was just what I was getting from the data and, and working through it on my own. I'll probably go back and try to actually improve the results and I'm gonna bring in other people's work there and I'll definitely cite that in the notebook itself. So that was just a, a quick warning. Um, you really wanna be careful and you really wanna make sure you give credit to other people's work that you're putting out. So without further ado, let's jump into the actual analysis. All right guys, so here is my Kaggle profile. As you can see, it is really new. I haven't unlocked any achievements yet, but hopefully that will change in the near future. So let's jump into the actual notebook here so we can find the competition here in the Titanic. Uh, it should be one of the ones at the bottom here. It's only up here because I've, I've participated in it. So before I enter in any competition, before I go through any workbook, I make sure to understand actually what's going on, like where the data is coming from, who, who, who it's gonna be valuable for, and everything along those lines. So we can go through and read here. Basically the idea with this data set is we wanna predict who actually would survive or who survived this class. So they give us a training set, we train our model, and then we actually try to predict which of the people in the test set survived this crash. So it's a little morbid, but it's still a good use case from, from actual history. So we can go through, there's pretty much everything you'd wanna know, how to submit all of these things, um, and, and so on. What, what is really relevant here for me is the data. So if you click on the data tab, you can see how to actually submit. You can see what the test data looks like, you know, what the columns, it looks like there are 11 columns. And you can also get some information about the individual variables. So for example, like siblings might be useful, number of parents on board. Um, these are all very relevant things. So I always wanna make sure before I do any feature engineering, before I start experimenting with the data, I have at least a little understanding of what, what the data encompasses. Next, let's actually work into my notebook. So if I wanted to create a new one, I would click here. I'm not gonna go through this live because some of the training takes quite a bit of time. And also maybe I'm a little, a little nervous to do it live yet. So um, I'm gonna go through one of the workbooks that I went through, but I'll, I'll still talk about some of the places I get stuck, some of the challenges that I had. Uh, and again, I really hope that this is helpful to you guys. So I think this is it, so here, you know, we always talk about how to write about your work. I mean, this isn't a perfect case study, but the way that I use Markdown, the way that I use comments is hopefully very clear to you guys. Right now, as you can see, I talk about what I plan to do with the data. I talk about what my best results were with the analysis that I used. And I walk through each of the steps that actually eventually got me to submitting my results. So. We'll go into this a little bit, but one thing, I, I actually write the overview at the end. I, I go through, I do all my outlining, and then I go back and make sure it makes sense to me logically how I go about it. 
So in this one, this they actually just give it to you. You import the data. I think at the top you also have to include the data. Um, and we read it in with this scripting. So before I write, before I do any project, I just like to think about the problem in light of the actual uh, data that we have. So this is a, a thing, you know, some comments that I do before I run almost every analysis. I, I go through these steps. So the first thing I want to understand the data. So like what, what data types are they? You know, are we working with numerics? Are we working with categoricals? What are some of the trends of the data? What are the averages? How many missing values do we have? Next, I look at the histograms and the box plots. Um, this un helps you understand the trends in the data. So we might see that, you know, for example, for FAIR, there's a lot of people that didn't pay anything. Is that something we have to dive into further? The following thing is I want to understand the value counts for the categoricals. So you can't really do histograms for categorical variables. So value counts, it just gives you like a nice little bar chart to see um, what categories people fall into. After that, I explore missing data a little bit more, and I start thinking about how I'd want to either remove missing data or impute the missing data. Following that, we want to start uh, thinking about our model building, and we do some correlation between the different metrics. We see what things are related and, and which things are related to our dependent variables, especially in a regression problem. This is clearly a classification problem, though. We're trying to predict a yes or a no. Yes, they survived. No, they didn't. Going forward, I just kind of brainstorm a couple things that, that I want to understand better. So did wealthy people survive? Did um, you know the, the cabin that they were in affect the, uh, their survival rate? Um, you know, did, did age affect you know, their ticket price? Is, is young and wealthy maybe a variable we want to explore? And then do we want to explore total spend? I actually don't think I went through and, and analyzed these yet, so in a, in a follow-up, maybe I'll go through and, and see if those actually affect the model that we have. After that, I wanted to do some feature engineering. I go through and maybe make some new variables. And then after that, we pre-process the data so that we can use it in the analysis in our models. Um, you know, after that, we start doing the model building. We, we think about, do we want to scale our data? Is it relevant? And I'll talk about some of the assumptions there. Now. There, there are really two things in my mind that affect how your model performs. The first, and which I think is probably the most important, is the data that goes in. So the better data that you have, the better your model is going to perform. The other way is you can actually tune your model and, and mess around with parameters, but I found that usually you get the biggest jumps when you include better data. And so that's where feature engineering is really important. I think that's probably the best way to make a you know, a couple percent increase in your performance, even over model optimization. So let's jump right into the light data exploration here. So what I like to do is I just run a, a, a couple of quick little commands to help us understand the shape of the data and these types of things. So as I've mentioned before, we do uh, training, which is our training data set, which we've um, isolated here. And we want to understand the data types and also the null values. So we can see age has quite a few null values and cabin has quite a few null values. So we're going to want to start thinking early about how we're going to manage that. We're going to go through and, and actually, you know, look at the, the differences down here. Uh, but this is just a good starting point. The next thing we want to do is I always want to try and use the uh, describe command. And so this shows us like the standard deviation. Um, what percent of the sample survived, you know, um, the average age of the groups, uh, the average family size, and things like that. So these all start helping us think about the data differently. We start just making associations and, you know, we're not reserving judgment yet. We're just starting and continuing to think of questions as we go. Uh, when we do this, I, I think it's relevant to break this into numeric variables and categorical variables. So these are things that, that we want to understand with a histogram, and these are things that we want to understand with value counts. So this line of code here, I just make histograms for all of the numeric variables, and I just plot the, the, what they are up top. So age follows a fairly normal distribution. Um, like the siblings do not and neither does like the, the parents. Uh, the fair also does not follow a normal distribution. So these are, you know, fair, for example, might be something that we want to um, 
actually normalize because there's such a spike at, at, at a very low uh, price. Some of these other things, there's few enough categories that it probably wouldn't matter. And age is already fairly normally distributed, so we don't really have to think about um, normalizing it. So I might have said scaling. We, we'd want to normalize these uh, and then scale them. So let's now look at some correlations. So as we can see, you know, um, the number of uh, parents and the number of siblings, so like families tend to travel together. Um, you know, these are so age and the number of children is is very highly uh, is very um, has a very negative correlation, uh, and and these help us to just understand um, the the different relationships in our data. If we're using regression, this could be really really important because we want to avoid multicollinearity, and that's when there are two variables that are too highly correlated and they have a um, overwhelming effect on the model. So the next thing we do is we just want to look at how uh, survival rates differ across these um, across these different groups. So if they survive, what's the average uh, age of survivors? Uh, what's the average price that they paid? Um, the average family size and the number of children. So, you know, it looks like, you know, these are not statistically significant, but we can start to see that Okay, younger people might have a higher chance of surviving. People that paid more, you know, you know maybe the, the rich survive, which is a kind of sad story here. Um, if you have parents, so if you're a kid and your, your parents are on board, they might put you first. Uh, and if you have siblings, if you're a child, uh, you might have slightly less of a chance of surviving. So these are all things that we want to take note of and think about when we're building our models. The next thing we do is we do a very similar thing to the histograms here but we use our categorical variable uh, data. So we look and see, okay, um, what is the survival rate? So zero is not survived, one is survived. Um, how many people are in each class? So there's you know, less people in these two. These are probably you know, general tickets. These are probably first class. Actually, we should look and see what those things are. Uh, so let's go back to the data um, so we can see Class, so yeah, first is first class, second class, third class. Now we go down and we look at, you know, th these are kind of unintelligible, but we can see, uh, you know, roughly the distribution of how much people paid in classes and on cabins. And then we can see where people embarked from. So we can see that embarked, uh, uh, Sherberg, Queenstown, and Southampton, those are the three locations. And we, we can evaluate how much of an impact all of these things have. So after we've done that, we do something very similar to this pivot table, and we do it for each of these different things. And we want to compare it to our dependent variable, which is if people survived. So we can see that by class, a lot more people in first class survive, survive proportionally than in these other ones. This probably suggests to us that there's some value um, in understanding uh, this actual problem. This will probably be relevant in our model. The next thing is, um, you know, men and women. So it looks like the saying, you know, women and children first actually applied in this scenario here. Um, finally, we don't really see anything too relevant. Maybe if they got on uh, this location, they have a slightly higher chance of surviving. All right, now moving on to the, the feature engineering. So we saw that ticket and cabin, there's just a ton of data and you know, there's only, I think, eight, 800 or so uh, samples here in the training set. So if we have too many uh, columns, that really doesn't cooperate well with our data. So we wanna simplify some of this through some feature engineering. So if we look at the actual cabin data, we see that there's um, basically a letter and then a number following it, and that's what cabin it is. So I wanted to separate them into individual cabins. And uh, to do that, I used a little bit of uh, regex. So we just split here on, um, on spaces. Um, and in the first one, I just wanted to see if they had multiple cabins. So some people had multiple cabins. It looks like the vast majority did, did, did not. Um, and we can see here that, you know, what the survival rate looked like across those things. The next thing 
is I wanted to look at uh, the actual um, letter of the cabin that they were in. So you would expect that uh, cabins with the same letter are in roughly the same locations. They might be the same floor, whatever that might be. And again, I use some very simple, uh, like a regular expression to strip this out. So N stands for NA. If you recall that we had, you know, almost three quarters of the data was null for this variable. But, you know, we can actually treat that null value as a categorical. So maybe if they don't have data on it, and we mark that, it might tell us something different about the data there, or it might tell us something additional. So we don't just have to drop those rows and not use them. We can use them as a feature and maybe that can help us. It probably won't, but it's at least worth experimenting with. So as you can see, you know, a lot of the people in the null column did not survive. Um, people that actually uh, did have a, a, a clear cabin had a lot higher survival rate unless they were an A. So I think that we can comfortably use the column letter as a categorical variable here, and that might give us a little bit more insight. You know, it takes it from having, you know, 50, 100 different unique cabins to having like less than, uh, you know, 10 or so. The next thing we want to look at is the tickets. So each ticket number was fairly close. It was either unique or very close to unique but some had letters and some just had numbers. And I thought that that might be telling. It, was, it probably is related to where they embarked from and things like that, but it was worth experimenting with. So I, um, I included those here. Uh, I, just as a variable, if they have a number, um, it, yeah, if they have a number, then, um, then it'd be a one. If there is some text involved, then it would be a zero. So as you can see, I just kind of explore all of the different ticket lettering conventions. And I, I didn't think that any of these uh, were common enough that we'd actually want to include them. So I just removed that and kept this more simple variable. I probably could have aggregated, I think CA or any of these with A's in them could have been combined together, but I didn't really know what all of these things were for. And you know, maybe if I wanted to go further in the analysis, this is something that I would look at. So the next thing I wanted to do is see if this had any impact. It looks like these ratios are pretty similar, so there, there wasn't really any value added from that, but it's again worth experimenting. You know, I think something that I wanna make very clear is that when you're doing this, it is experimental. A lot of the things that you try are not gonna work, but that makes it so much more exciting when one of the things that you do try does work. So we experimented with the ticket letters here, and again, there wasn't anything too relevant. In some of the models that we're gonna use, it, it makes sense just to throw in as much data as you can, and, and the model will sit through it. Um, in the random forest or decision trees, they, um, you know, they split on the greatest variables that have the largest different fir differences first. So if there's nothing really significant there, it probably wouldn't split on it at all, or, or at least very late. So, uh, the next thing we do is I wanted to look at the individual people's names. So I thought that this might give us a little bit more data than just if they were male or female. So as you see, there's doctors on boards, reverends, majors, um, there's a lady, a countess, and these are things that might, um, you know, if someone's royalty or something like that, they might have a higher chance of surviving. Uh, for a lot of these, they're you know, very small samples of. So I would have liked to have aggregated just slightly more, but I thought, you know, for the sake of time and for this data set, um, I would keep it as is. There aren't too, too many different um, surnames. Again, I did this with some very simple, um, you know, regular expressions or, or just by using some, some basic Python commands. If I wanted to really try and improve this, I'd try and group some of these uh, names together, you know, maybe uh, working people like doctors, reverends, or, or military people uh, should be grouped together. Um, and it would be also be interesting to see if the captain went down with the ship or not. I think that that's, you know, like an idiom that people talk about quite a bit. So after we've explored the data, and again, this isn't, this isn't very in-depth of an analysis. This is just enough to get, you know, moving on the model building part. You know, I, I probably could have spent, you know, 20 hours just on the on the data exploration part. And that's kind of what makes a project unique is that you can go down these different avenues. You start thinking about these different questions like, 
Um, you know, like this one that we just talked about, if the captain survived or if royalty had a higher instance of surviving, you can really make some cool visuals uh, relating to that as well. I didn't want to focus this one as much on the exploration. I just wanted to go through kind of a whole pipeline to, to get you guys familiar with the process here. So next we go into actually pre-processing for the model. So none of these models handle null data well. So we drop, we want to drop the null values from embarked. We also only want to include relevant uh, data. So I only included ones that we had featured engineered or were, that were like fine as they were. Uh, next, we have to actually, you know, transform all this data. And I used, uh, you know, pandas get dummies. Uh, what that means is when you have multiple categorical variables. So let's say, you know, like the the, the class, the cabin, right? We have seven different things. Uh, I think it was seven, maybe it was 10 different cabins. But um, in order for the model to use that, for each of those individual cabins, you need one column and the column has a, you know, basically a zero if they weren't in that cabin and a one if they were in that cabin. So that's how we actually uh, integrate that categorical variable into those categor categorical variables into our analysis. You can't just have them as one chunk in most cases or one column in most cases. So, you know, basically what I do here is I take all of the data. Uh, so I join the uh, training and the test sets because it's easier to make sure that the training data has the same columns as the test data uh, if I do it this way. It also, for the case of a Kaggle competition, might give us a little bit more information in the training set about the distribution of the test set. This is not, I want to be clear, not a good practice for real world data science. Uh, you generally want to have, you want to train a one hot encoder, you want to train a scalar only on the training data. And then you, you, um, you, you know, uh, you transform your test data using the encoder that was only trained on the train data that, that assures that your distributions and stuff are very similar. Again, in this case where we want as much information about the test set as possible, it might make sense to do it how I did it here. It's also a lot shorter and easier to do it how I did it here. So for the sake of time, that's, that's why I analyzed it this way. So, um, you know, going forward, we just do all of the same transforms that we did only on the test set before, and we do them across the training and the test data. We also fill the age with the mean and, oops, we fill the, uh, the fair with the mean as well. We, in theory, probably should have used the median for fair because it was not normally distributed. So that is something that I'll take into account and I might, when I go back through this experiment and see if that actually helps. I, I don't think that there were that many missing fair values. I'd have to look up top. We can do that pretty quickly. Well, this notebook wasn't, wasn't as short as I thought. So uh, we can see fair, actually I don't think there were any uh, missing values. So. That's good to know. All right. Next, we actually drop the, um, the, the columns that had embarked, I mean, the rows that had um, embarked in, um, uh, with, a, we drop the rows that had nulls and embarked here. Um, you know, finally, I decided to try and normalize a couple of different things. I didn't actually use the normalized siblings in here. It, it just looked really wonky. Uh, but we, we normalize the fair and we get a closer to normal distribution here, which I think is good. So that, that to me made sense to use instead of the traditional fair data. Um, yeah, so after that, we create our dummies down here. We split it back into our train and test sets. And then we're actually ready to get going here. So we have our train, uh, our, our train uh, variables and our train dependent variables. And what we want to do is we actually want to try a bunch of these different models and experiment with how they do. So the way that we tell how they do is we, we use cross validation. So what that does is it takes some of the samples of our training set and it splits them off and it trains on this data. I, well, so what it does is it randomly samples from our training data. Uh, we run a model on some of that training data and then it predicts uh, on, the, on that model there. This way we're 
you know, validating it on data that's held out. And that should give us a better estimation of how this will perform in the real world. So we were, for the first pass, I just ran a bunch of like the basic models without tuning any parameters to see how things would go. So I tried a naive Bayes, which I think is generally the baseline. It's a very simple model. Um, and you'd expect other models to do better, but sometimes you just want to try with kind of the easiest thing. Next, I looked at logistic regression, decision tree, k-nearest neighbor, random force, support vector classifier, um, xgboost, and then I tried a voting classifier. So I wouldn't really worry about knowing what all of these models are right now. I think it's important to just understand uh, how to implement them. And when you're just starting out in data science, it's okay to just try all the models and uh, see what works best. It gets a little bit more intricate when you're trying to figure out what data you're using and how that goes with the model specifically. Luckily, this model, I mean, this data is very generalizable and pretty much all of these models should work fairly well. Um, you know, you, you do have to understand a little bit more of the math when you start getting to feature tuning, but that's also an experimental process as well. So we import the cross-validation and that's how we're gonna evaluate uh, the success of these models with the cross-val score here. So to, to run any of these, you just import it from sklearn, you create an instance of it, and then you can uh, fit it to the data down here. I'll show you how to, how to do this without cross-validation when we're actually uh, you know, predicting for the, for the results on the, the test set, but I'll save that till a little later. Uh, I'm gonna go through and, and show you how I did some feature tuning as well. So the next thing, I think it's important to talk about the voting classifier as well. So a voting classifier means you just take a bunch of the different classifiers and they you know, literally vote on, um, on which, uh, if, if they think the person survived or not. So let's say we have five classifiers and three of them say that they survived. In what's known as a hard voting classifier, then the model would spit out that they believe that, it sur that, that person survived. <clears throat> If we're using a soft voting classifier, that means that the models are sending forward their like confidence or the probability that they think this person survived. So let's say the logistic, let's just use a, a two voting classifier that is soft. Let's say the logistic regression uh, said that it was 100% chance that this person survived and the K nearest, nearest neighbor said that there was a 30% chance that this person survived. Even though that they're, you know, one is saying one direction and one saying the other direction, you would average the 100% and the 30%. So that would be over 50% and it would still say that uh, the voting classifier would believe that they survived. So that's how voting works. Generally, if you have some breadth of models, voting classifiers work very well because they help to normalize your results and generalize the data a little bit. So uh, in most cases, ensemble approaches, which are already, you know, uh, Random Forest, actually Boost are already ensemble approaches. They're really powerful uh, techniques for solving problems. And you know they are generally a best practice when you're not using deep learning. In this notebook, I chose not to use deep learning. The, the size of the data is very small, so it probably wouldn't be optimal. Uh, and it's also fun to just go through and not have to worry about the deep learning implications going forward. So for the voting classifier, we also uh, did the cross file score and you can see it's a little lower than I think the uh, random the support vector classifier was and uh, That's okay. Just because these are doing great in validation Doesn't mean they aren't um, They're gonna do as well on the actual test set So that's something to keep in mind You still have to experiment with the testing data and you know when they're doing really well here It might actually mean that they're over training slightly so Let's go down here and actually start thinking about model tuning. So as you can see, I have a grid or, or a, a table of the performance after tuning, and you can see almost all of our performance increased. For naive Bayes, it doesn't you know, really make a ton of sense to, to feature tune that. There aren't really too many levers you can pull to improve it. Uh, with decision tree, there are, but we're using random forest and uh, XGBoost, which are both tree-based models. And we would expect that these would actually perform better. So I didn't think it was relevant to, to actually spend the time tuning that one. What we're gonna use to tune is grid search and randomized search. So 
With any of these, uh, Grid Search allows you to just put in a bunch of parameters and try them all, and it'll spit out what parameters have the best results. <laughs> so that's what we do here is we actually go through, we try all these parameters, and these are the parameters that ended up having the best performance for us. And this is the score that, that it had. So we do that for all of these different classifiers. Each of the different classifiers have different parameters. I think that that's probably a, a story for another time, but I, I believe I was fairly exhaustive with, with most of these classifiers for uh, the different things that you can try. So for Random Forest and XG Boost, there's like, you know, technically infinite number of parameters that you can try. And if I tried them all, it would take days, months, years, whatever it would be. So I used a kind of funnel approach to find parameters that work well for me. So I did a very broad uh, random, uh, randomized classifier, so a randomized search. And what that does is it doesn't try everything in this grid. It doesn't try all of the options. It randomly samples from it, and it gives you what the best results were. And then after you have the best results, you can tune it a little bit more and find something that, that uh, does just a little bit better. So this is a way to kind of simplify on time and maybe shorten your workflow a little bit. So for here, we get our, our best classifier with random forest was at you know 83.5%. And then for um, down here, XG Boost, the best performance, I believe, was like 85.2, which is really high. So in this case, it actually ended up overfitting, spoiler alert, uh, and, and that didn't produce the best results. But it's interesting to have in here that that, that was a really high performance. One thing that, that I haven't talked at all about in this is the actual feature importances. So what this means is which of the variables that we put in, which of the features actually have the greatest impact on predicting if someone will survive or not. So, you know, just looking at this, we see that the, how much they paid, their age, if they're, you know, if they had, if they were male, basically, uh, if they were female, and then if they were in, um, you know, the, I guess it's like normal class, not first class or second class. Those are the things that had the largest impact. Next, we see, uh, you know, like if they had children um, and, uh, you know, if they had multiple cabins, which is interesting. So I think that all of these are pretty cool and relevant and that helps us understand our problem a little bit better. So maybe even with with our fare, if we experimented with that a little bit more, we might be able to get even better returns. Um, you know, some of where they embarked from didn't seem that important, and maybe we could actually remove some of these things and they might be a little bit confounding. So, for some of our models. For other models, they probably aren't relevant at all. So, I went through and tuned these things, and for, uh, I thought the performance of XG Boost as well as Random Forest were worth exploring and just sending them in. Um, and so I submitted both of those, but I also wanted to do another voting classifier with our actual tuned model. So what I did is I went through and we did the exact same thing that we did before. I just took the best estimators from all of the tuned variables and I made a bunch of different voting classifiers. So I tried a hard voting, a soft voting with just uh, K nearest neighbors, random forest and support vector classifier. And then I tried one with, with all of them except XG, XG Boost, And then I tried one with XG Boost to see how they would perform. And so we can see that, you know, in that order that I did them in, uh, the best results came from this one. When I actually submitted it, that was not the case. The best results uh, came from this one, which I thought was very interesting. It looks like maybe the XG Boost one just um, overtrained a little bit. And so that's part of this process. It's iterative, it's experimenting, and you know, there are a couple things that I probably want to tweak and see if they actually have uh, a positive impact on. So uh, one of the last things that I did was I wanted to see if the weighting impacted um, the output here. So I did a grid search and I experimented with different votes in the, uh, the soft voting classifier. So what that means is I can add additional weighting to one or two of the models so that it counts for more in, in the analysis. So I tried different weighting all the way across and it turns out that the weighting that we had was actually optimal, it produced the best score still. So this code is just basically um, 
like going through and like fitting all of the data. So for each of the classifiers we made, we have to fit it to the data. And after we fit it, we can go down here and predict the results that we got. So, you know, this is how you'd actually use the models. What this produces is a, um, a, a, a series with all of the uh, answers to your, to your problems there. So uh, with, with all your predictions for the input variables there. So this next one, I just go through and I make them into data frames and I make it so that I can actually export them into Excel. I ran a little bit more code here to just see what the differences between the outputs were. You know, if we were submitting data that was all the same, um, you know, if two of the voting classifiers produced the same results on, on the testing, it wouldn't make sense to include them. So all of them had slight differences, you know, between three and, and in this case, you know, eight to, to 12 different uh, variables here. The last thing I did was I actually submitted this workbook. Um, and you do that by just creating uh, Excel files in the local instance. And then at the top, um, when you go in and, and, and run this, you can do, you can click up here and then you can actually commit the changes. So you click, you click that and run it and it runs through your whole workbook. This takes for this analysis because I had all the tuning with random forests quite a bit of time. So I didn't include those, uh, you know, so I didn't include that part uh, in here. When you actually want to submit, you can click output and you'll have all of your output files here. So let's say I wanted to submit um, a new version of the XGBoost. I would go through and submit that. And um, well, it looks like it, it didn't train, so that wasn't very good, but um, you get the idea here. So um, as you can see, the best results that I had were these two runs that I did. Um, I'm going to probably try and get it just a little bit better so I can break into that top 10%. You know, that's just some fun tuning that I'm going to experiment with. And, you know, hopefully we can, um, we can do a little better and, and uh, improve our performance here. So hopefully that was a, a good way. I mean, this was fairly in depth. This was a long analysis, uh, but hopefully I broke it down in simplest enough terms to get you started. You can go through, you can walk through the code. You can definitely ask questions of me, um, but I just wanted to get this kind of Kaggle series started. I'm planning to do something along these lines almost every month. I think that showing you how to do some of these projects can really help uh, kickstart things and, and get you thinking about this in the right way. So as usual, thank you so much for watching and good luck on your data science journey.